Welcome to CISO's Insiders Podcast, powered by GRC Consulting. In this podcast, we'll be interviewing leading CISOs and security leaders in the industry for light, eye-level conversations. Here, they share advice and tips, talk about their biggest accomplishments and failures, favorite drinks, key influencers, and much more. We encourage you to walk away with at least one insight that will help you better yourself or your business. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more content, please check us out on social media. Welcome, everybody. Today I'm speaking with Roselle Safran. Uh, Roselle, um, I know you've started your career as an environmental engineer, and you held a f- couple of other positions. You even founded a company back in 2002 before moving into the cybersecurity space and you know i believe you started off as uh in the crime investigation uh, space before moving into consultancy and then at some point uh, between uh, under the obama administration i believe you're actually um in the cybersecurity space at the white house and we'll probably ask you a bunch of questions about that uh, but maybe, and I know you run your own company now, it's a new startup, but maybe you can step in and properly introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah, thank you. A pleasure to, to be here. So, so yeah, my career path has had lots of interesting twists and turns. Uh, I studied civil engineering, specifically focused in environmental engineering when, when I was at Princeton. Uh, I was in that field for a year, and then I decided, oh, tech sounds really interesting, and I was in Silicon, I was in San Francisco during the the end of the dot com boom and 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 a lot of the bust. Um, so I I kind of switched gears to to tech companies. Tried my hand in entrepreneurships in the the early two thousands, uh, and and then eventually found a, a job posting as a computer crime investigator. And the job sounded fascinating. I had zero experience in it, but I said, you know, I'm just going to apply and convince the hiring manager that I'll learn on the job. And I was able to do that. And so, and that got me on, on the, the path of, of cybersecurity because I was doing computer forensics. And I actually, uh, I, I did learn on the job and I earned certifications while I was on the job. I had an ENCE, I think I was 600 and something in the world to have that certification. So it was all very new. Uh, and, and so, and some of the investigations that I were doing, I was doing were very squarely focused on cybersecurity. Others were around theft of intellectual property, employee misconduct and the like. Um, and then I kept kept going on the, the computer forensics road for, for a number of years, because it's, it's basically detective work on a computer and, and I, yeah. I love doing that. And so I worked for a, gover- uh, a government contractor. I worked for Ernst & Young, um, then eventually moved to the Department of Homeland Security in the division that was then called US CERT, now it's CISA. And that, that their mission is to improve the security posture of government agencies and critical infrastructure. So it was a great perch to see what was going on um, just at a high level. And I was also uh, an entrepreneur there and developed a a threat intel platform internally before the term threat intel platform was even coined. And so that was used by the the US CERT analysts uh, in the the really early days of threat intel sharing. Uh, And then from there, I I moved to the department, uh, to the executive office of the president. Mm. And this was during the, the Obama administration. And uh, I was leading cybersecurity operations, and so I was spending lots of time on, on the strategic side, figuring out how we could optimize our operations and, and just make more of the limited resources we had. was never too far from what was going on on the, the tactical side, uh, and, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, there was a government shutdown while I was there, and I ended up going back to doing analysis work for a little while on the night shift, no less. Um, so got, got to, to see so much. Um, it was a fantastic experience. And just being um, on the operational side for so long, it just gave me a, a good sense of where there were technology gaps. And that's when I decided to switch gears to the entrepreneurial side. And so I had an incident response platform company that was sold to McAfee. And now I'm at Key Caliber, 
Uh, this is my second cybersecurity startup that I founded. And it's a risk-informed asset management company. And yeah, it's been an amazing journey. I'm very, very thankful for all the opportunities I've had. Yeah, sounds exciting. I mean, even your first gig uh, in, you know, as a crime investigator sounds exciting and interesting to me. And obviously, you know, your journey has been a very impressive one. And so thank you for taking, uh, you know, uh, some of your time to to get together today and talk. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we're, we're going to probably, you know, stick to the usual format, but we'll introduce a few alternative questions here because I do want to learn more about, uh, you know, specifically about what was going on like, to the extent that you can share, obviously, in your in, in some of your positions. So, uh, yeah, we can get started. I always like to start off by asking a couple of icebreaker questions. Uh, if you're willing to share your marital status and favorite drink, that would be great. Um, so yeah, I've never been married. Um, favorite drink, because I'm not much of a drinker, but I do like sangria. Sangria, well, that's on the sweet side. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, now let's dive right in. If there's one thing you wish you'd known before you began your career, what would that be? Yeah, so I would say it's the importance of people. And the, the, sounds a little crazy that, that I didn't really know that at the beginning of my career, but I was very uh, focused on just doing well and did well in school, did well in my jobs, didn't really think much about the, the interactions with other people and didn't spend any time on networking or, or building relationships. And, and that's something that I've learned later in my career is profoundly valuable some in some cases the most valuable aspect uh, of any career and and so I didn't realize that early and it's unfortunate because I actually really like that side of it too it's not not only that I think it's important but I think it's it's awesome to be able to develop strong relationships with with people that you're working with and and so that they they know that they can trust you and then you can trust them and and you can learn from them and, and they can learn from you and it's it's a it's a great virtuous circle um and so yeah that's something that i, I didn't know early on mm -hmm. and what would you uh, regard as your biggest failure so i i you know i'd like to not characterize anything as a failure i'd like to call it more of a learning experience um but but I would say actually the the startup that I tried really early on um, in 2002, it was not, not at all related to cybersecurity. This was before I was in that space. Um, it, was, it was called City Athletes and it was designed to help people find workout partners uh, for or soccer teams or to, to just to do participatory, participatory sports and, and you know, build a community with that. Um, I think it was way ahead of its time. It, it never really got off the ground because I didn't know what, what I was doing at all. Uh, and there also wasn't the same infrastructure around building startups and 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 there wasn't that the ecosystem um, that there is today. There weren't like, lots of accelerator programs or, or ways to help people get off the ground. And I remember going to the library and getting a book on how to write a business plan. It, I was way off. Um, and so the, the company never really got off the ground, although I, I did technically sell it, um, but it was a fantastic learning experience. And I learned a ton about what it does take to, to have a, a, a successful company. And then you need to have knowledge of, of the industry. You need to have resources. Um, and I also learned that I really like entrepreneurship. And I just, I got the bug back then and I knew that I'd eventually get back to it. Yeah. And you know, uh, this question is, might seem uh, intrusive, but the intent here is to, uh, you know, to ask you what you learned from that. And obviously you've learned a lot. And someone else once told me, well, actually one of the participants in this podcast told me that, uh, you know, failure is just a constant feedback loop. So this is how you learn, how we learn as, as, as a species, I think. So so thank you for sharing that. Um, and what would you consider your biggest accomplishment? Uh, because I mean, you, you've, you've walked us through your bio and obviously you've had a few. Yeah, I would say it's key caliber because we have 
an amazing team. I'm so proud and thankful that I have the, the team that I have for this company. And, and you know, going back to what I was saying about like, people being everything, with the right people, everything is possible. With the wrong people, everything is a struggle. Mm -hmm. And we have the right people and we've we've built an amazing product that's really addressing a critical need and in an innovative way. And I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of all of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, and how large is your team, by the way? Just out of curiosity. We're small but mighty. We're nine full time. Well, I mean that's an impressive start, and you know, yeah. good, good. You can build great stuff with uh, that team. Exactly. With, with a team that size, I mean. Yeah. Great. So, um, you know, let's touch a bit about your. Uh, you know, previous role, because usually I'm speaking to CISOs in the civilian world or, you know, banking industry, whatever industry. I want to see if there's any difference or, you know, but before that, you know, could you walk us through that transition from, you know, forensic and crime investigation into the, the role of an operational security of, um, uh, what was it, the operation security manager, in, so, operation cyber security manager at the White House? Yeah, so so I was originally doing a com the computer crime investigator job was um, internet investigations and computer forensics. With computer forensics, you can basically take it down three different roads. You can do civil investigations. That's some of what I was doing then. You can do law enforcement investigations, um, or you can do uh, computer um, cybersecurity investigations. And I eventually decided to go fully down the, the cybersecurity path um, because it, it seemed interesting to me. And, and my, I'd like to say that there was more thought and strategy involved in my, my career choices than, than there was. Um, a, a lot of it was not in terms of having this, this game plan for where I wanted to be at a certain point, but it was more of here's a cool opportunity that it's presenting itself right now. I want to jump in and, and try it. Uh, and I was never hindered by the fact that I didn't have the skill set at the time when, when I was applying for the job because I figured out, I'll, I'll learn on the job. I'm resilient and I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, and so that's, that's really how that transition happened where I was doing different types of of um, internet of, of cybersecurity investigations, and that eventually led me to um, the the executive office of the president. I will say, from from my experience on the, the the private sector side, I did at one point just come to this conclusion that I needed to really be behind the mission in order to to get excited about getting up every day. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't get behind the mission of, okay, this is a big corporation and I'm making money for the, the big corporation. That, that just wasn't enough of a motivation for me. And I decided at that point that I wanted to either work for the government, a nonprofit, or myself. And that's kind of been what I've done since then, where, where I've been able to really get behind what what I'm doing from a mission perspective as, as much as anything else. Okay, okay, thank you. And but and and how does it feel or or how did it feel, you know, being a part of that uh, organization, being, you know, the cybersecurity or one of the leaders of cybersecurity under the president of the United States? Well, I I mean it was an honor and I I was very very proud and very honored to to be in that role and I felt super strongly about the mission. And I I couldn't really think of a, a better way to spend spend my time. Um and and that was that was something that rang true the, the entire time that that I was there. Um yeah, you know, working for the government in general, it's just you, you have a different perspective as to why you're you're doing what you're doing. And I, I, I will say it was immensely stressful. I, I was so concerned that there was gonna be a major breach that was gonna be front page news. And that did not happen under my watch, but it, it did happen after I left. So it was a completely legitimate concern. 
And I mean, I was up, it was, we were 24 by seven. We were a small team, but we were 24 by seven. And every night I was up either talking to the team at midnight or at least checking on, on my, it was a Blackberry then. Um, if there were any, any messages that came in, always keeping tabs on what was happening uh, because it, it was a, a, a big responsibility. And, and I, I felt very strongly about that. Mm -hmm. And what would you say are the similar aspects between, you know, that organization to any civilian based organization, if there are any? Yeah, I mean, there's there's just a ton of similarity across every cybersecurity shop. I mean, you're dealing with the, the same challenges in your environment of not knowing what you have and having a hard time get, assessing all of that. Um, the the types of attacks are often the same. They're in many cases the same exact attackers, and and you're often using the the same technologies and, and same procedures. Uh, so so there's very much that it, it whether you're you're defending a, a federal government agency or you're defending a a big bank or a, a small manufacturing company. A lot of it is is consistent across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the exception of uh, like you know one of the risks, obviously that any organization need needs to deal with is uh, reputational damage. So I'm assuming that specific risk in this case would be <laughs> uh, would carry a heavier weight. Okay, oh yeah, assume, yeah, you know. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, there, yeah, there, there are definitely a few differences, yeah, in in how certainly how anything is perceived. Mm -hmm. um, so and... yeah, let, let's let's try to you know uncover some of these differences. If you so you know, obviously that's one. You can think of any any other different aspects of you know running that show versus running or usual regular like a bank or what you said, the manufacturing company. I would say one of the big differences is in the government side, there's much more of a focus on attribution, particularly when it comes to APTs. Mm -hmm. So understanding which threat actor was involved in the attack and um, and building the, the threat intelligence around what that threat actor is doing and the the, the TTPs that they're using to, to carry out their attacks. Uh, and that was something that kind of surprised me when I switched gears to the entrepreneurial side and and I was selling technology to to the private sector. And there just there wasn't that same yeah. level of yeah. distinction between, all right, this is an APT attack and and this particular group from this particular country. It was more of it's an attack. Let's just deal with it. Um, and so so that that I would say was one of the the bigger differences. and and part of it is because you know the the attacker motivation is different. Mm -hmm. And what we were concerned about on the government side was, you know, particularly nation state actors and some of their motivations. And you know, with a company that with their concern is just making sure that they continue to, to make money. Uh, it's just a very different view of, of what needs to be addressed and why. Yeah, and you know, I've not noticed that uh, in the civilian world, like the lack of appetite for an APT it's pretty pretty dominant, especially when we're looking at uh, smaller types of organizations, even SMEs. I think, and I would I would even you know go on a limb and say that maybe just a handful of enterprises, not a handful, but just a small amount or small percentage of enterprises deal with the APTs. Uh, maybe for the sake of our listeners, do you want to just outline like key differences between a regular uh, attack and an APT? Yeah, so an APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, um, it's generally a, a nation state actor. And so what, and, and that's very different from say your, your crimeware syndicate, which is a lot of what people see today um, with some of the ransomware attacks, certainly with anything that's happening on the personal side, it's, it's for financial gain. Mm -hmm. Whereas with an APT, it's it's more of yeah you know, the the country has some specific motivation behind what they're doing and it, it's part of a, a a larger plan and 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 there's a lot that goes into that from from the standpoint of understanding like foreign policy and and dyna dynamics between countries 
And that's something that that people on the government side have to be very cognizant of. Whereas on the the, the private sector side, it's just it, it doesn't have that that same level of priority. Yeah, yeah, and and we did see a few breaches in the past few years for you know critical infrastructure related uh, breaches that might or might not have been the result of an APT. But exactly, yeah. So yeah, that, it's a good point. Like, APT is not confined to just the the public sector. Um, so certainly critical infrastructure, defense, industrial base. I mean, there there are certainly sectors where um, there there almost as much of a target, if not more of a target than, than government agencies, and often because of their, their interaction with government agencies or their impact on, on national security. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, uh, just touching a bit more about uh, on your journey here, uh, in your opinion, was there like a specific tipping point in your career that ultimately helped you in landing that position at the White House? And I know we've spoken about that uh, briefly, but uh, was it like a one single decision or anything? I mean, honestly, the one single decision was deciding to apply for the job. Because I, because when I first looked at the posting, I thought this sounds awesome, but they probably already have somebody lined up for this. And this is gonna not be the best use of, of, of my time. But I said, you know what? This is such a cool sounding job. I'm gonna apply even though it, there may already be somebody lined up. Mm -hmm. And even in the interview, I my the thought in the back of my head was, this is this is a cool experience, um, but they've already got someone lined up for this. <laughs> uh, so 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 that that was a lot of it, it was just saying, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go for it. It doesn't yeah. matter. And and that that proved to to be all that we needed. That's a great answer. Thank you. And what are the most important skills that you feel that you've acquired uh, in that specific position that actually helped you becoming an entrepreneur and you know in that role specifically? I think the, all the time that I spent in in trying to optimize what we were doing and just find efficiencies in whatever we were doing, and, and both of my startups have been around this concept of being more efficient being and optimizing limited resource, resources because every organization has that problem. Like, no matter how big you are, no matter how big your budget is, you, you don't have enough to do everything that you want to do. And so it's a matter of being able to optimize and prioritize. And, and I spent a, a ton of time around getting procedures in place so that we could operate more efficiently and, and trying to automate as much as possible because that's kind of, the, it's the name of the game in, in cybersecurity. Uh, I would say that and also being better about translating risk into to terms that non-security folks could understand. I mean, I, I think I definitely had a little bit of the security purist mentality um, going in as to, well, but this is not a secure way of doing it, so this can't be done. And and then, you know, the, 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 the deputy CIO would say, Roselle, we are not telling the office of the president that they can't do this. That's <laughs> not an option. So you're gonna have to go up with another way of handling this. And so so being able to to strike a better balance of that was something that that I also learned on that job. Mm -hmm. And you know, speaking about learning, and obviously you've learned a ton and uh, on the fly, like at various jobs. Uh, what were the best resources? Well, like, what did you do in order to learn to gain that knowledge? Did you like, you know, to course it? Did you went uh, online? Did you Google? Did you obtain certifications? What did you do? All of the above. I mean, yeah, it's just. I mean the with cybersecurity, like, in my mind, part of the beauty of it is you're constantly learning. Mm -hmm. There's always something new that that's happening, and you've got to to stay on top of it. And so, so yeah, early on, I, I, you know, part of what was agreed upon when I was, uh, when I was when I received the offer for my first job in in the industry was I'll learn on the job. And so I earned a CISSP and an ENCE, and that was just me like, studying on my own on the weekends and doing everything that I needed to do to, to get those certifications. Uh, so it, it was just a, a, a lot of just groundwork and 
I had no problem with it because I, I was learning and I was interested in learning and, and I, I've always been that way. And I, I particularly like to just kind of jump in and start doing it. And that, that's how I learn best. So on many of my investigations, I'd come across something new and just figure it out along the way, just start researching. And, and Google wasn't as big then as it is now, but I would research with you know, the resources that were available then. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, and um, looking at the industry, and you know a great deal about the industry, obviously, what's the one common myth that, in your opinion, uh, that you think we you need to debunk? So uh, what I would say, and, and I, I'm not trying to be anti-education, but I would say I've talked to a number of people who feel that they need a master's in cybersecurity before they can get into the industry. And I'm always telling people, no, just jump right in now. Just, you can get a, a quick certification that's like a couple months as opposed to two years and it's way less expensive. And then you have enough of a foundation where, where you could jump in. So I think this, this, this mindset that, that some folks have that you need to have a formal education in cybersecurity before you can be in that career, I think that needs to be squashed so we get more talent coming in faster. Yeah, I, I, I mean, personally, I agree with your, uh, you know, with what you said in that mindset, and I'm the same. I think a lot of the times what I'm hearing from other people is the, you know, there's a lack of confidence in oneself sometimes when, yeah. you know, what you said, like, uh, yeah, I'll be able to learn on a job. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make do, I'll handle whatever comes my way. I think that's in, again, in my opinion and from, you know, the people I talk to um, both on professional and the non-professional world, I think, I think that's a relatively unique uh, trait. Uh, I don't think most people are as confident, uh, you know, with their skills. And so I think, you know, reverting back to, yeah, let's get my, you know, whatever master's degree first, you know, that's the easiest, the easier route because yeah, now I'm, I'm, I, I just need to be focused on this one thing for whatever, like three, two, three, four years. And I don't have to, you know, deal with, uh, with actual challenges that that's my opinion, but. Uh, yeah, thanks. it's a good point. It's a good point. But I feel even with that, I mean, you could shortcut it with just a certification. Uh, yeah. And, you know, hopefully that provides enough um, to to develop some confidence. But but yeah, I, I think that that is probably one of the main factors for why people think, okay, no, I need to continue yeah. going to school before I can can even try. No, yeah, and as, as I said, I, I think I'm I'm pretty. I mean. I operate in a very similar manner. I, I started off with an MCSC back in whatever, what was it, like 23 years ago? Because that was my shortcut at a time into the tech world. So I can definitely relate to what you're saying. Um, okay, let's see. what. So I did want to touch about a few more topics here before I let you go. Um, let's uh, talk a bit about CISOs nowadays. Um, you know, because you know a lot about CISOs and I, I, you're probably selling to, in some respect to CISOs and have sold to CISOs in the past. What are the main concerns that in your opinion, CISOs nowadays should have? So I think the biggest issue for organizations today is operational resilience. Just making sure that you're up and running. You know, it used to be, from a, a, a cybersecurity perspective, we were really focused on the confidentiality side of the, the, the CIA. The side. CIA pillar, yeah. Exactly. But now I would say the availability side is, is way more important. And obviously ransomware attacks have, have kind of brought that to the fore, but just the, the, the whole move to, to the cloud and, and digital transformation has just put more in a digital form and businesses and, and agencies need to have that and have it accessible in order for them to, to perform their operations. And, and so from a security standpoint, that's, that has to be the, the, what's front and center because that's, that's business enablement and that's making sure that, that the lights stay on and, and 
that in my mind, it has to be the, the top priority more so than say you know, of specific regulation and, and this and that it's no you you got to make sure that that you're staying up and running and and a, a big portion of that ends up falling on the shoulders of the security program because there are so many threats and attacks these days mm -hmm. in other words keep the lights uh, on and make sure that uh, business is continuously operating uh, and well, and there's no, uh, I could ask you like a follow-up question on, you know, how you get to that point, but there's no single answer. So unless you want to take a stab at it. Well, I mean, this is, this is sort of the bread and butter for, for my, my company right now. So this is a topic that I could talk about all day long. Um, but I mean, it starts with knowing what you have. Mm -hmm. You have to know what you have, and then you have to know, okay, within that whole crazy environment, what's most important and what's most at risk. And then you can start chipping away at where there's risk, particularly around what's most important to make sure that like, what's most important is going to be up and running and it's going to get the attention it deserves, no matter what else is going on. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a challenge, especially because the, the traditional approach has been around, well, if we're trying to find out what's, what's most important, what our crown jewels are, let's do a, a survey and ask a bunch of people and, and spend a few months collecting answers. Mm -hmm. And if they're trying to figure out what's the highest risk, then there are lots of wishy-washy ways of, of calculating risk and, and again, surveys. And so it's been historically a big challenge, uh, but that's why I, I wanted to address this problem because mm -hmm. at the end of the, the day, the security has to make sure that the operations are resilient and, and can withstand like, any type of attack that comes in. And, and that starts with knowing what you have to, to protect so that you can have the right security posture around it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's a great response. Uh, in your opinion, what are the most important skills that CISOs nowadays should have? I would say it's being that bridge between what's actually happening in the weeds on the technical side of cybersecurity and what senior leadership and the board needs to know and needs to understand. And it's, it's being that sort of translation layer. And so that requires having at least some technical skill to the extent of understanding how that fits in the bigger picture for the organization. And then the other side of, of being the bridge is around being able to, to navigate, I won't call it office politics, but just the, the dynamics of the company so that you're articulating in a way where it's it's going to be heard and recognized as okay yes this is something we we need to to keep our eyes on we need to be paying attention to and i mean it's 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 no easy feat because if you're coming from a security background it's really easy to just get into the minutia of you know, ip addresses and hash values and all these these nuances um, that are are not gonna make any sense to folks that are outside of the realm of, of cybersecurity. And and if you can't be that bridge, then you're just you're not gonna get the the support and the resources that you you need or that are anywhere close to what you need uh, if you can't really articulate the, the cybersecurity risk in, 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 in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that this, a good CISO should be able to, or should know how to speak two languages, one yeah. talking to the more, you know, technical folks, whether it's uh, around application security or infrastructure or cloud or whatever that might be. And on the other end, uh, like, you know, also speak the business language, speaking and communicating with the leaders and uh, in order to get the support that you need, because this is the same goal, same mission that everybody yeah, has. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Got to speak two different languages and, and then figure out a way to to go from one to the other when when you're having those conversations. Yep. Got it. And, and you know, with that in mind, where do you think their seizure role is going? Like looking at, I don't know, five years into the future, 10 years into the future. 
Well, I mean, if we look at where it's come from, where cybersecurity used to be this this backwater division of IT. Down in the basement, you know, no windows, all that, yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah, and and now to the point where some boards are requiring someone with cybersecurity expertise, it's already gone through this, this amazing evolution of gaining prevalence. And, and so I see heading more in this direction of like, the CISO is going to have to be reporting to the board or like reporting directly to the CEO. And it's, instead of being really buried in the org chart, like having this, this true C-suite position because cyber risk is business risk. And the, the department that handles cyber risk is cyber cybersecurity. So I, I see there definitely being more of a movement to, for CISOs getting a seat at the table and, and having their voice heard. And that's why it's particularly important that they be able to, to speak well and speak articulately when they're, they're in that position and, and that they're, they're talking in, in business language so that even though under the hood, there's lots that's going on from a technical perspective, what's being discussed to the board or senior leadership is at the level where they could say, okay, I see how this is impactful to the organization. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive answer. So now in your opinion, what would we see in the market next, like new trends or what would we see in the, you know, this cybersecurity space next? Yeah, well, certainly there's a lot that, that, that that's happening. I mean, I think some of the the fundamentals have not been addressed as as well as as they need to be and it goes back to what I was saying before about knowing what you have, knowing what's important, knowing what's most at risk. That's from you look at the NIST CSF framework, it's the identify phase. And it's not, you know, protect it and, and detect and respond. They're they're the flashy ones. And and everyone wants to spend their time on, on them because that's where you know you're really you're you're going after the bad guys or you're blocking the bad guys. But that identify phase needs to be done well in order for those other phases to be done well. And I think there there's gonna be more of a movement, of, of more of a rec recognizing of the fact that yes, we've got to get these basics, this cyber hygiene, this squared away, so that we can build upon a, a strong foundation. And I also think that that moving more towards being able to articulate risk in a way that that's understandable to to folks in in higher positions outside of security. And like we've talked about this already. That that's going to become even even more important in, in the next few years. Uh, I also think there's going to be more legislation coming down the pike. I mean, this is purely from an outsider view. I'm in DC, but I have no knowledge of anything on, on the, the legislative side. But it, I, I just get the impression that that there's going to be more movement in that direction, um, and you know, hopefully that's that's more around. Okay, get the fundamentals right, uh, and where it's not just oh, this, these companies can decide whether they want to focus on the, the fundamentals and get it right. But it's more of, no, we have legislation that's going to mandate that you get this right because you're creating this, this risk to the economy, to national security, if you don't get it right. Um, and then and I also think that cyber insurance is going to have like a, a bigger role in all of this. And that's still kind of being figured out what that, that role is going to be. And, and that's, it's sort of a, a, a new industry where there's still lots that needs to be worked out as to what's being covered, what's not, how the insurers can understand what risk they're, they're underwriting. Uh, so I, I see a lot of, of movement in that area as well. Mm -hmm. And, and it seems like you, you're very passionate and that you believe in, you know, in the, that, vision that you just uh, outlined here so and i believe your company uh, deals with a lot of these issues key caliber uh, be sure to check that one out uh and and yeah thank you thank you for that uh overview 
Um, now, you know, before we wrap this up, I just have a couple more questions for you. Uh, are there any specific people that are, have been influential to you throughout your career? You know, I'm, I'm kind of weird. I've never had a mentor and, and it's, everybody was, has a mentor nowadays. You, you can't. Yeah. Have a yeah. And I, I, I was 10 years into my career before I even knew what that was, um, from a, in a business context. And so, so yeah, so I, I, I've kind of been just charting my own course in, in a, a unique way. Um, but there certainly have been a couple, um, fellow entrepreneurs, who have been super supportive, um, and and like a couple of them are investors in my my current company, um, like uh, Doug Uran, who was the the founder of ThreatGrid, and Summit Agrawal, who was one of the co-founders of um, Shape Security, where they're just immensely helpful in terms of being able to share their experiences and and, and provide advice. Um, but, but yeah, I've, I've been kind of rolling, um, with, without like a, someone who's been sort of guiding, um, in, in any way. I, I would like to uh, be on the other side of that and be able to help guide people. Um, uh, but, but I, I didn't go that route. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, what's the best way to connect with you online? So, um, email, I'm on my email way too much at the time, uh, but roselle at keycaliber.com or LinkedIn. I'm also on, on LinkedIn quite a bit and love connecting with folks. Uh, it's always exciting when I get LinkedIn requests because people say, I heard your webinar or I saw your presentation. And um, so I wanted to connect. And yeah, so, just just get to a point where they start uh, trying to sell you like, uh, you know, you get 50, 100 uh, requests a day and everybody's trying to sell you something from software development in Romania, Ukraine, or whatever it is, to anything else. But uh... there are lots of those. Yes, that, yeah. that's absolutely true. But the folks who, who are reaching out because they've, they've seen a webinar that I've done. Or, or no, that's a, exciting. Or a podcast, they're, they're, they're usually practitioner folks. Um, yeah. And, and that, yeah, I just I, I love getting those connection requests. Got it. And my final question is uh, um, somewhat uh, on a personal nature. If money was never an issue, what would you do with your life? So I would start a nonprofit because that, that that's the other one. I, I said I wanted to work for the government, work for my, myself and start a nonprofit. So I would definitely do that. Um, I'd, I'd probably also start a, a, a fund to, to, in, to invest in, in exciting technologies. Um, and and I'd spend a lot more time at the beach. I'm definitely a beach person. I've, I've come to to recognize that. I spend uh, try to go to the Caribbean every few months, and so so yeah, I I'd be spending a lot more time at the beach. Or just do what a lot of um, people from New York have been doing since the pandemic started. They moved to Florida. They have a beautiful beaches there, right? Yes, you know, I, I I've thought about that. I have thought about that. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, but, uh, some of the Caribbean islands just, yeah, that, that's, quite... that's a different, uh, different yeah. animal, of course. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure having you here today. Uh, thank you for your time, Roselle, uh, looking for, uh, for, you know, next talk and connecting with you in the future. And I'm sure your answers and experience sharing here would, uh, help and provide some value to our listeners. Any final thoughts? Thank you for, for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, the pleasure was mine. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.